<laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Community Acquired Bacterial Pneumonia, a 2016 perspective. I am Christina Jewell of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented and sponsored by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, go to www.labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credit. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credit. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Glenn Tolotson. Glenn is a Senior Vice President at Semper Incorporated in Chapel Hill, United States of America. He is trained in medical microbiology and infectious diseases and almost 30 years of pharmaceutical industry experience in various areas, including clinical research, commercialization, scientific communication, including publication planning, strategic drug development, life cycle management, and global launch programs. Glenn has been instrumental in the development of ciprofloxacin, ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin, as well as drugs in the as other drugs in the Bayer portfolio for whom he worked for 15 years. He later worked for Optimer Pharmaceuticals as Senior Vice President of Medical Affairs and built a team to support the launch of Fidaxamycin Difficid, the first new antibiotic for C. difficile in over 20 years. Glenn is a member of the Scientific Steering Committee for the GTC Bio Annual Summit on anti-infective partnering as well as the Anaerobe Society. He is also past chair of the ACCP Executive Council of Networks and a member of the ACCP, I apologize, he is past chair of the ACCP Chest Infection Network and a member of the ACCP Executive Council of Networks. In 2009, Glenn was honored by the American College of Chest Physicians with the Alfred Sofer Award for con contribution to the college. Glenn is on several journal editorial advisory boards, including the Lancet Infectious Disease and F1000. I will now turn it over to Dr. Tolatsen for his presentation. Dr. Tolatsen? Well, I'm hopeful. Hopefully, everybody is able to hear me. Uh, hello. I'm not going to say good morning or good afternoon. So, I'm going to speak for the next 40 minutes or so about community acquired bacterial pneumonia. Interestingly, this term has evolved in the United States over the last few years from community acquired pneumonia or CAP, as many of us refer to it, which is caused by both bacterial and viral pathogens. However, about six, seven years ago, 2009, the FDA issued guidance, which will help us distinguish between the organisms that cause pneumonia, whether they are bacterial or viral, and really this was an effort to address the concerns about antibiotic resistance. So I will generally refer to the term CABP, but if I lapse into CAP, please forgive me. So what is community-acquired pneumonia? 
I'm sure many of you on the, on the WebEx have heard of pneumonia. Community acquired is different from hospital acquired and so forth. But basically community acquired pneumonia is where you acquire an infection of the pulmonary parenchyma that's part of your lung. And it's an acute infection. Basically means you've acquired those pathogens in the community, not the hospital. Typically, this is accompanied by the presence of a, what's called an infiltrate, and I'll show you an infiltrate in a few moments on a chest x-ray. But as a physician, if you listen to someone's chest, you can hear wheezing, rattling, and all sorts of other auscultatory findings, and those are consistent with pneumonia. And to be community-acquired pneumonia, you should not have been hospitalized or in a, a long-term care facility for the prior couple of weeks. How does pneumonia manifest itself? Well, typically, you'll have a temperature, you'll have the shakes, the rigors, you'll sweat, and you will cough. You may produce sputum, you may not. And usually, if you produce sputum, it's, it's a glorious colour that I won't describe too much. But then there are other symptoms, such as fatigue or tiredness, muscle pains, abdominal pain, which if you think about it, if you're coughing a lot, you get abdominal pain. So on the screen, you will see a variety of, of other uh, symptoms that we would use to, to guide toward diagnosis of CAP. You can see there on this chest x-ray, there's a circled area on the, the left hand side, the right lower lobe, as you can see it, that is an infiltration. That is where the, the x-rays are unable to penetrate through to the blackness that you can see for the rest of the lung. That white patch is, is bad news. Now chest x-rays positive like this, maybe due to infection, may have other causes. But in addition to the things I've just mentioned, fever and so forth, you start to build up a picture, the jigsaw cap. What are the risk factors for, for developing community-acquired pneumonia? Well, age. And those over the age of 60 have a higher tendency and, and proclivity to actually developing pneumonia. Alcoholism, alcoholism does things to your immune system. So again, that's a risk factor. Smoking, I don't need to mention that. Conditions like asthma, and further down you'll see COPD, obviously those cause your lungs to be defective in some way, allowing the access of, of organisms, bacteria, or viruses. Immunosuppression, that's a, an obvious problem. Institutionalization, there you come into contact with a range of different bacteria, and if you're institutionalized, there's a chance that you've got some other um, risk factor. Bottom of the list, but by no means the least, dementia. Again, that's associated with, with host defense uh, reductions. What causes pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia? Well, there is one organism that we've known about for probably about 100 years Streptococcus pneumoniae, originally called Diplococcus pneumoniae. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in a few moments. But pretty much wherever you manifest your pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia is the main bacterial cause. And you can see here, I've broken the, the locations where you manifest your disease, outpatient, primary care setting, which really is the vast majority of community acquired pneumonias, the inpatient where you're admitted to the local hospital, or if you're really sick, you go to the intensive care unit. And you can see the top uh, pathogen for all of those is strep pneumonia. And then it varies a little, mycoplasma, haemophilus, whereas on the inpatient ICU, you see more organisms like Staphylococcus aureus, Legionella, and then the gram-negatives like Klebsiella and E. coli. So hopefully, for those listening and watching, you're familiar with many of these bacterial names. And although I've ranked them at the bottom, the respiratory viruses also obviously must not be neglected. Here I'm talking about influenza virus, rhinovirus, corona, and adenovirus. So those play a role in community acquired pneumonia. And in a number of cases, probably around 30%, you will actually have two things causing your, your pneumonic condition. Now, it has been said that the, the, the symptoms and, and so forth that you present with are suggestive of, of a certain type of pathogen. I'm sorry to burst that bubble, but really research over many, many years has, has refute, would refute the clinical signs and symptoms and epidemiological features guide you to a pathogen. I think there are, uh, there's a real need for, for microbiology confirmation. So 
a little lab test that you would do to, to confirm community acquired pneumonia. Well, first of all, you take a blood sample and look for white blood cells. Those should be elevated. And by that, I'm talking 10, 12, 15,000 sort of white blood count. You should obtain a good quality sputum sample and do a gram film. You'll see one of those in a moment. If the patient goes to hospital or is quite sick in the community, you should take blood cultures, preferably two sets from two locations to make sure that you know what's isolated from the blood is a genuine cause of, of bacteremia or blood, bloodstream infections. You can also take a sample of urine and because streptococcus pneumoniae and also legionella pneumophila, the, the outer coat of those bacteria actually are excreted in your urine, you can actually detect both of those uh, pathogens in a urinary test, which obviously is, is relatively convenient. The hard part in all of this that I've just discussed is actually getting a good quality sputum sample. And a good quality sputum sample should be predominantly pus cells. And pus cells, if you look at the, the uh, gram film that you can see on the screen, those, um, th those cells that have got multiple multinucleated cells those are, are white blood cells, pus cells. And you can see lots of small, deep purple little spots around those. You'll notice that many of them seem to be in pairs. Well, those are diplococci. That is a very good image of uh, sputum with streptococcus pneumoniae causing the pneumonia. And we strive to get good quality samples because often the production and what we call expectoration of sputum travels through your mouth and we need to reduce the amount of oral mouth flora so that what we see is really what's causing your problem. And there, as I say, you've got a very good example of, of pneumococcal pneumonia. So I've told you what the, how the disease manifests and what causes the disease. Clearly one of the things that we want to do with, with community acquired bacterial pneumonia is prescribe an antibiotic. And and up until the, the sort of the 1940s, we didn't have that, uh, that benefit. And some of the, the older ways of treating pneumonia were quite radical. Come the 1940s, we had penicillin and it's moved on from there. But as some of you may remember, Fleming in receiving his Nobel Prize commented that bacteria will sooner or later work out to become resistant. So I'm going to, for the next few moments, speak about bacteria and their resistance to certain antibiotics or antimicrobials. We have good data in a variety of uh, locations around the world. I'm going to focus on the US because I think you know, we can tell you a good, coherent, consistent story, but equally I could provide data for Europe and also for, for Asia. But focusing on the US, and I'm focused here on Streptococcus pneumoniae, just looking at macrolide resistance, the reason I've focused on macrolides is that and that would be a drug like erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin. Those are the common ones in the US. In Europe, there are one or two other macrolides available. But strep pneumo is the number one pathogen, and the macrolide or doxycycline are the recommended drugs from the ATS and IDSA guidelines for treating low risk, no risk outpatient uh, pneumonias, which actually constitute a very large proportion of your, your community acquired pneumonias. So you can see over the last 15 or so years, macrolide resistance in pneumococci has gone from just over 30% now to almost 50%. And that's a, a broad picture across the USA. Now, if you recall two, three years ago, the CDC here in the USA was particularly concerned about antibiotic resistance and came up with, uh, to want a better phrase, a leak table. And depending upon how serious the, the threat was, the, the CDC listed these different pathogens. And Streptococcus pneumoniae found a, a position on that in the, the, the urgent category. And it, here are some facts and figures. Hopefully you could see them clear enough, but drug resistant Streptococcus pneumoniae, we've got 7,000 deaths, excess medical costs, excess hospitalizations. It's pretty evident that drug resistant pneumococci are a major burden and a major challenge when you're thinking about empirical therapy. And that's what most physicians have to do with CAP. They don't have the luxury of sophisticated laboratories and, and that sort of approach. They have to treat with an antibiotic pretty quickly. So 
GDC feel that Streptococcus pneumoniae is a challenge? It's not just macrolides, but there are other antibiotics that have resistance issues. And you can see on the left-hand side here, resistance rates to some of the other you know, frequently used antibiotics. Just to give you an idea of, you know, this train has left the station. Antibiotic resistance in the US has continued to be a problem. And I'm sure many of you on the, on the WebEx will appreciate that. You know, we have President Obama's PCAST and a whole host of other initiatives to manage antibiotic resistance. And here you can see some data presented um, about 18 months ago, which looked at Streptococcus pneumoniae susceptibility to the common antimicrobials over a four year period. And you can see that all of them, each of the classes of antibiotics examined, whether it's penicillin, ampicillin, amoxiclav, erythromycin, tetracycline, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or far right levofloxacin, all of them have shown a decrease in susceptibility, i.e. an increase in resistance over the last four years. And I think this is, is typical of what's going on out there in the community. It's important though that we, we ensure that prescribers and patients actually understand the importance of this. However, antibiotic resistance is not um, homogeneous. And if you look at this map of the USA, you can see the heterogeneity in, in, in pneumococcal resistance here. I've chosen the macrolides. Erythromycin is the, the parent of the class, but more recently, plarithromycin and specifically azithromycin have become the major macrolides of, of preference. But you can see, looking at the, the map here of the, of the USA, you can see that over in the far west, the Pacific and the mountain region, the resistance rate is around 30, 40%. You would come further east and you can see that in the central and over to the, the Atlantic coast, the resistance rate increases quite markedly. In fact, in Texas and Alabama and down in those, those states, we're over 60% of the pneumococci are resistant to one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics, which is a little bit of an empirical concern. Macrolide resistance is not unique to the USA. If you look at the red line, which is 25% resistance, you know, North America from this data is, is above the red line. Europe, depending where you are in Europe, the, the average is 28%, but that can differ between different countries. Spain, Italy, and Greece have got levels more akin to the US of 40%. If you go to the Far East, to, to Asia, and more specifically to China, you're looking at 70 to 90% resistance, which are quite significant levels of resistance. So as again, I say, this is the most, one of the most commonly prescribed classes of antibiotics. So we appreciate that what pneumonia is, how it presents, what does it look like? We, we know that community acquired pneumonia requires antibiotic treatment, seeing some of the issues with regard to resistance, but does resistance matter? Is, does it have any burden? Well, for the next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the, the things that we're able to measure in terms of pneumonia as an illness. So for example, it is quite prevalent. And by that, annually in the United States, 9 million prescriptions are dispensed for what would be coded as ICD-10 coded as, as pneumonia. Over a million patients annually are hospitalized there's almost 5 million visits to the primary care doctor, or their equivalent. And as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, the older patients are affected disproportionately. And it was Osler that described pneumonia as the old man's friend, which basically meant, you know, the older person who has, uh, is debilitated and is looking for a way out, pneumonia was often a way out. It's been estimated that the cost in the USA alone is in excess of $10 billion per year, purely due to pneumonia. And if you're concerned about, is pneumonia a cause of mortality? If you look to the right-hand side, the histogram there shows that pneumonia accounts for more deaths than either breast or prostate cancer. I think that's a, a fairly significant impact. I mentioned that over a million patients are hospitalized here. You can see increasing numbers of uh, visits to the emergency department 
In England, we'd call it the casualty department, but now almost 3.3 million people will go to the emergency room because of pneumonia. That's a lot of hospital visits. Potentially could be avoided. If you then look at hospital admissions or admissions to the intensive care unit, I, I'm sure you will agree, chest pain and congestive heart failure are two of the, the more um, obvious and, and expected um, reasons for going to, to, into hospital. But over half a million patients will be admitted to US hospitals with pneumonia or something similar to pneumonia. And we're looking here at about almost 4% of all intensive care admissions. Sadly, even though we, we, we try to treat these patients appropriately with the right antibiotics, about 15% of them will come back into hospital because of their pneumonia. So it really is important to, to recognize these patients, recognize their risk factors and treat them appropriately as soon as you can. So in medicine nowadays, we like guidelines. We like uh, routes and algorithms to make sure we manage our patients properly. And not surprisingly, we have a range of different society guidelines to help us manage this, this maze of, of bacterial and viral infections. And in fact, the, the route to, to the, the better treatment is, is through the current guidelines, or is it? Let me just give you a little bit of a feel. What tends to happen in primary care, where there's, there's large numbers of, of pneumonia cases, antibiotics have been used in a workhorse capacity. Many physicians adopt a sort of conservative attitude and go low, go slow type approach. And they think about these you know, new, powerful, really potent drugs. They only use those for the patients that are not responding. However, a theory, hypothesis, was proposed in 1913 by Paul Ehrlich, and his philosophy was to hit hard and hit early. Now, this is actually 20 years before the advent of antibiotics from Doma, but nevertheless, he called it chemotherapy. So in 1913, Paul Ehrlich came up with the frappe forte, frappe vite, which is hit hard and hit early with an appropriate antibiotic. And if you use the right antibiotic and it works in a killing fashion, then you should be able to work for just the right period of time, kill the bacteria and get out. So short duration of treatment and where appropriate, you can scale down. Now, a number of patients will, we, we have to, as you said, as we said before, go to the emergency department, and may well be admitted to the hospital. In which case, those are sick patients and those sick patients deserve some more prompt and aggressive therapy perhaps a parental therapy, like an intravenous. So you can start off with intravenous therapy and when they've stabilized, and I'll talk a little bit like about that in a few moments, you can then maybe turn them to an oral medication. And maybe even send them home where most people get better sooner. So what do we have currently for community acquired pneumonia? Well, nine years ago, there was a joint effort from the Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Society and they broke out pneumonia into various components. And again, this is community acquired pneumonia. It's not hospital acquired, healthcare associated. These I'm referring to community acquired pneumonia. And the far left, the previously healthy, these are people with no underlying disease, generally you know, younger patients, but not always. And if they've not had an antibiotic in the prior three months for anything, then a macrolide or tetracycline, doxycycline are the recommended choices. However, the IDSA also say that any region where antibiotic resistance amongst pneumococci, the number one bacterial cause, if that resistance rate exceeds 25%, then you need to find an alternative. Now, I didn't show you earlier the tetracycline resistance rates in the US, but they're presently around 27, 28%, something like that. So for the previously healthy, no antibiotics in the prior three months. Macrolide resistance is approaching 50% in the US. Doxycycline resistance is over 25%. Your options are reduced. If though that patient has got comorbidities, by that I mean COPD, asthma, some of the things I call risk factors earlier, 
or you know they're just generally you think they need more help you could use what's called a respiratory fluoroquinolone and the three members of that group is levofloxacin moxifloxacin and gemifloxacin or you could use a combination of the beta lactam which is amoxicillin i suppose is probably one of the the best recognized of the beta lactams and macrolide why would you use that combination well beta lactams are pretty good for 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 sorry <laughs> for um for some of the pneumococci, but they're not very good against the atypical species like Macroplasma or Legionella or rarely Chlamydia. That's where the macrolide comes in. The macrolide treats most of those quite well. Although in the USA, we are seeing Mycoplasma pneumonia with macrolide resistance starting to emerge. So as you can see, some of your options are, are a little bit limited nowadays. But if you look to the far, far right here, we have to think about macroalgus and streptococcus pneumoniae and consider using alternative agents such as cephalosporin or possibly doxycycline if you're in, in an area where you know your resistance rates are, are a bit lower. So that's what you do in the community. But if you go to the hospital, what do you do? Well, if you go to the general ward, to the floor, as it's often called here, so this is a, a sick patient, but not really sick, then you would give them a respiratory fluoroquinolone, which I've just described, or the beta-lactam and the macrolide. So pretty much what you saw as the comorbidity uh, regimen, but use this in, in the hospital. And as I say, most people, if they go into hospital, would receive it, an intravenous uh, dose or two to start with. So it's, it's an old adage. You know. The other thing is that sick patients generally don't tolerate oral drugs well, and their absorption is a bit uns unpredictable. If though the patient is seriously ill, and that's a, a, usually high white count, high fever, rigors, and so forth, they go to the intensive care unit. And here again, you would use a beta lactam. I would probably expect most places to use a drug called ceftriaxone, and they would also use azithromycin, both available as IVs. Or you could use the same beta lactam, ceftriaxone, with a fluoroquinolone. So those are the options where you don't suspect some of the really difficult pathogens and have not really focused on pseudomonas, serogenosa and so forth. That really is more for a talk on hospital acquired pneumonia. Those pathogens do occur in community acquired pneumonia, but less than 2% of the time. I mentioned before about duration of treatment. Well, here are some other um, guidelines that have been published, actually one or two since the, the American guidelines. BTS, the British Thoracic Society, and the ERS, the European Respiratory Society. And you can see there's a little bit of variability here. In the US, we say patients should be treated for a minimum of five days. But in order to, to stop therapy, they really should have had no temperature, i.e. a febrile, for two to three days. And they really shouldn't have any of the symptoms of pneumonia, still indicating a clinical instability. If you feel that the patient has got a, an underlying comorbid condition, or if they're in, identified to having some form of what we call extra pulmonary infection, such as meningitis or a bloodstream infection, then you clearly treat for as long as the patient requires it. And as I said earlier, you're looking for clinical stability. In, in Britain, again, we look at disease, disease severity, and the therapy should continue for seven to 21 days. And the 21 days really comes from, from the, the old ways of managing Legionella disease. And then at the bottom, the ERS uh, have basically said duration of treatment should generally not exceed eight days. That is a, it gives you a little bit of room for maneuver. So what are the issues currently with treating community-acquired bacterial pneumonia? And you can see here that I described the, the primary options, cephalosporins, with a macrolide or respiratory fluoroquinolone. And then some of the issues that you can see, see here, some drugs don't have an oral option, even though they're a very potent IV. And it may be that some of the uh, macrolides that are used just have the, the gaps in their, their spectrum that you would be concerned about. Equally, some of the other antibiotics have got uh, an adverse event profile that is, is, is less than optimal. 
you need to be concerned about some of the conditions, some of the things like clustering difficile. And as you heard from the introduction, that's something I'm familiar with. You also need to be concerned about you know, tendon ruptures, some of the cardiac issues that occur with um, antibiotics. And obviously, community acquired pneumonia also affects children. So you need to think about that option as well. So choosing an antibiotic is not just as simple as reaching for the prescription pad. Not that anyone does that anymore. It's all click, click on your computer. But it's much more complex than just reaching for a script. I think I just mentioned about the formulation and duration of therapy. Here are some of the criteria that one would think about changing from IV to oral. So improvement in cough and breathlessness. Your temperature has dropped to two time points. Hopefully your white cell count is, is diminishing and you've got a functioning gut that would allow you to take an oral drug and that it is then absorbed. And you can see some of the other reasons for wanting to switch to oral treatment mentioned just now about some of the safety concerns. Um, antibiotics, by their very nature, are toxic. Fortunately, they are more toxic to bacteria than to humans. But each of the antibiotic classes we, we use nowadays, and I've chosen three heat classes here just to give you some examples, but I could give you more examples about the tetracyclines, the folate antagonists, and so forth. But of the three major classes that are used in, in community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, I'm going to focus on the, the, the big three. So macrolides, in terms of, of things you as a prescriber should be concerned about, are things that we would be warned or have, be, be, you know, have precautions about. Hypersensitivity, I'm sure you all understand that's having an allergic reaction to, to the set drug. Hepatotoxicity, it refers to liver dysfunction one form or another. Most of the time, it's transient, it's not a problem, but it does occur. QT prolongation is a cardiac event. And again, most of the time, it's not a problem, but every now and then, yes, there can be an issue. But then the more common things that you associate with most antibiotics are things like diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, and vomiting. And really, if you think about it, you've taken a medicine, it's sat in your stomach, and it's probably pay, playing havoc with your normal bowel flora, amongst other things. So those are the typical macrolide events. The quinolones, we see a different array of, of issues here. And I'm sure some of you have heard some of the recent uh, warnings and, and uh, remarks from the, the US FDA on this. And you can see here on the left some of the things that are more, more prevalent with, with fluoroquinolones. And coming from a background of developing Cipro and moxifloxacins, some of these are familiar, to say the least. CNS events like dizziness and confusion, tendon issues, again, back to the cardiac QT prolongation. Hypersensitivity, that can occur with almost any drug that does occur with, with fluoroquinolones, neuropathies and, and C. diff. And again, at the bottom, the common things such as GI upsets, nausea, vomiting, and obviously because of the C. diff, there are some diarrheal problems. And then to round out the, the events seen with the common drugs, beta-lactams. And by this, I'm talking about uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, some of the cephalosporins like cefuroxine acetyl, and also ceftriaxone. So here we're concerned hypersensitivity, clostridium difficile, and again, particularly in some of the parental cephalosporins, you see an element of hepatotoxicity. At the bottom, diarrhea, nausea, but also with beta lactams, you see um, an incidence of rashes. Sometimes those rashes can be pretty unpleasant and quite painful. So we've spoken about the burden of, of pneumonia, and we've talked about the resistance rates in, in pneumococcal pneumonia. Obviously, in this day and age, we are concerned about the, the economic implications. You know, the health system costs quite a lot of money, and as an individual, we want to make sure that the, you know, we're getting the right treatment at the right time, but hopefully at the right sort of cost. So I'm going to show you a couple of studies here that, that talk about what were the impacts of, of actually treating community-wide pneumonia with different drugs, and in this case, we focused on macrolide resistance, and really looking at what happens when you have a threshold. And you may recall from earlier that the IDSA uh, recommended that if an area has more than 25% resistance to a certain type of antibiotic, macrolides, then you need to look for uh, an alternative therapy. They were doing that because they were concerned about clinical failure. But if you take that then to terms of dollars and cents, 
there are some quite significant issues here. And this is an, an elegant piece of work by Carl Ash, um, co-published in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. I think it was about six or eight years ago now. But I'm not going to read through all of, of what you see here, but in essence, they collected data from what are called metropolitan statistical areas, which in essence means big cities. And they, they, they concentrated the data on patients who were 18 and over, and they had a, a coding. They were recognized and diagnosed as having pneumonia, and they received an antibiotic within, within seven days. Not surprisingly, the study, the average age was around 48 years old, half roughly, male, female, and half, just over half of them, 56%, lived in an MSA, a city area, where the resistance rate was below 25%. But remember, this was a study that was concluded in 2005, and in the intervening nine years, things have changed quite a bit. So what Ash and Cole did, they actually compared the areas with higher than 25% resistance and those lower. And you can see here, this is clinical failure, clinical success, 13% failure in the greater than 25% group, and 8% in the less than 25%. And that was a significant difference in terms of clinical failure. As you can see, the p-value there in the green box, less than 0 0.001. So that is a clinical failure. So what, I hear you say, does this really matter? Here, we're looking at the, the dollars incurred. So again, on the left-hand side, greater than 25%, and you can see where there's a treatment success in the blue, 2000, just over $2,000, but in a resistance 25% and greater, failure cost was almost $4,000. Less than 25%, again, was better to have a treatment success, just over $1,300, but even a treatment failure in the more susceptible area was around $2,800. So you know, treatment failure is bad news, but treatment failures in resistant areas are even more bad news. So you know, we're converting here clinical failure, clinical success, more expensive outcomes altogether. And again, this has been looked at in a, in a variety of healthcare utilization and looking at specifically drug resistant strep pneumonia. And here we're looking at uh, the health utilization of costs. And here they were looking at specifically different types of antimicrobial resistance. So we have penicillin resistance, erythromycin, the macrolide, and fluoroquinolone resistance. And again, looking at pneumococcal pneumonia. And so, so we have four uh, bars here, erythromycin resistance on the far, far left, penicillin resistance, fluoroquinolone, and then we have multi-drug resistance, either erythromycin and penicillin resistance or a combination of the three, which is uncommon, but you can see that the direct costs for erythromycin resistance or multi-drug resistance are very similar, just under 100, 100 million or thereabouts. But if you look at indirect costs, the overall burden of antibiotic resistance and strep pneumonia is pretty significant. And it's often those sort of numbers that are not factored into the overall picture of the impact of community acquired bacterial pneumonia. And if you look in the bottom uh, box there, the cost of antibiotic resistance was estimated at you know, 91 million, but 233 million when you included work and productivity loss. Remember, not everybody that gets pneumonia is over the age of 65. There's still a large chunk of working age people in there. And the incremental medical cost was actually related to hospitalization due to erythromycin resistance. So if you can avoid or reduce the macrolide resistance, there is a likelihood you may be able to impact some of the, the um, adverse medical implication, like hospitalization, and emergency visits, and that sort of thing. So why do antibiotics fail in treating community-acquired pneumonia? Well, the diagnosis may be wrong. And there's a whole bunch of reasons, I think you said earlier on, you can have a positive chest x-ray, but you may not be infected. So you need to pull together some of the other signs and symptoms along with your chest x-ray. The other issue is that somebody may have been rapidly deteriorating, their clinical condition was, was just, as we would say in England, the patient was going off. And you did not get them to the emergency, to the intensive care unit quickly enough. 
and that can have dire consequences. From a bacterial point of view, we have this discordance or mismatch between the resistance or the antibiotic susceptibility and the anticipated pathogen. And there I'm referring to strep pneumo is the number one pathogen, but you need to know your local resistance rates in order to avoid this type of mismatch. You know, on the Pacific side, you may have less of a, of a consideration than you would in perhaps the, the south central areas. So always be aware of your local conditions. And it may be that you've been into hospital for some other reason and you've developed what's called a super infection and a nosocomial super infection, I guess Clostridium difficile would be the most obvious one. The, the therapeutic part of this is that you didn't use enough drug, you underdosed the drug. So, you know, I suppose to be simplistic about it, you know, a 100 pound old lady may require less of an antibiotic than a 300 pound linebacker. You know, maybe my, I'm exaggerating a little there, but we do need to think about what drug we give to whom, and we also need to think about how long we give it. So again, insufficient treatment duration. I know we're all anxious to stop the antibiotics as soon as we can, but we shouldn't overdo that. So trying to pull this all together, if one talks to, to physicians and nurses and other uh, practitioners, you'd be surprised about the awareness or, or the lack of awareness about how deadly and serious community acquired bacterial pneumonia is and the impact that this disease has on you know, important things such as morbidity, mortality and the healthcare system costs. Antibiotic resistance does pose a, a challenge to treating CAB effectively and the current treatment options really at the current point give the physicians a, a, a dilemma. They have to trade off between drug efficacy, how well does it work, and what can be the potential downfalls in terms of, of safety. So in conclusion, community acquired bacterial pneumonia is a common and debilitating illness. It tends to affect the elderly patients disproportionately. It does have a marked mortality in the elderly. I didn't dwell on that point, but you know, the older patient do, they do die more frequently. Antibiotic resistance is a global issue, including the USA, but it varies within the USA. Bacteria really don't know any boundaries. They'll migrate where they need to migrate. So knowing what's going on locally as well as nationally is important before you start to prescribe an antibiotic. I think we've seen reasonable evidence to suggest that some of the standard first line agents are losing their efficacy or they may still be efficacious, but there are other uh, things to consider before prescribing those drugs. I think currently, the guidelines for community acquired pneumonia uh, need adjusting and then I think we're all aware that there is an update in progress. You can check out the IDSA, uh, IDSA website to, to get to, to date on that. Um, but to conclude, I think all experts recognise that bacterial resistance is costly in a variety of different ways and we really do need new agents quite urgently. Thank you very much indeed. if I'm supposed to do anything. <laughs> Dr. Tlesson, thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, Dr. Tlotson, our first question is, why don't companies develop more inhaled antibiotics as long as where the majority of infections, respiratory, happen? Pneumonia. There are some uh, challenges when, when one thinks about how to actually deliver an inhaled antibiotic. 
uh, in the community setting, that would be quite the challenge. Quite often these patients are, are either on ventilators or require um, major medical and, and nursing support in order to get, uh, to get the right sort of delivery. So inhaled antibiotics seem a good option. And as I say, there are aminoglycosides and quinolones being developed uh, for pneumonia, but it's generally nosocomial or hospital, hospital acquired pneumonia. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Sorry for the delay. We're experiencing just a little bit of technical difficulty, but we got this under control. Next question. How significant is the p-value? Okay, the p-value Generally, one would say that anything that's got a p-value of less than 0 0.05 it is significant. So I think I quoted a p-value in, in the presentation of 0 0.001. In, in layman's terms, that's quite significant. And I think you know, if you look for, for values that are, are less than 0 0.05, or you know, I think you're starting to believe the credibility of, a, of, a, of, a, of an investigation. If p-values are below there, perhaps p less than 0 0.01. So I hope that answers the statistical question. Please forgive me, I'm not a statistician. Uh, I just try to use the p-values that are given to me. So I hope that helps. Next question, Dr. Tolatson. Is, any, is there any way to use the existing antibiotics without generating persisters? Very good question. Um, I think because we have already developed quite a, uh, a population of persistent or resistant bacteria, it's going to be uh, quite the uphill challenge to, 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 to reverse that trend. Uh, there have been population experiments along those lines over the last 30 to 40 years, but none, to my knowledge, have been successful. It requires a a draconian approach to antibiotic use and because we tend to be, um, how can I put it, a little haphazard sometimes in our antibiotic usage, it, it would be very difficult to actually reverse from where we are currently situated. So that's why we need new antibiotics to, to actually try to overcome those, those current problems. Next question, is there any significant relation between air pollution and CAPB? Okay, I think that's a, it's an interesting environmental question. I think if you consider that asthma and COPD are both uh, risk factors with regard to developing uh, CABP, then I think we understand that there is an environmental influence in both of those conditions. So indirectly, I guess there is a relationship between CABP and, and the environment. Um, I guess it would be quite interesting to compare you know, the epidemiological phenomena in areas of the, the world where in you know, air pollution is much more of an issue than other parts of the world. Um, I'm not really going to try and point fingers, but I think it would be interesting to do those sort of, of analyses. Um, I think rest assured that the, um, the pneumonia rates, and I can sp speak to this because I'm British, <laughs> um, the pneumonia rates in London in the 1950s were somewhat higher than the rates of pneumonia today. And I think you know, if one considers the, the, uh, the, the air quality and the changes in the intervening 50 years, then I think you know, cleaner air is a better prognosis altogether. Thank you. Dr. Tolatson, next question. Is Penn still not resistant with SPN? 
day. Penicillin resistance um, and, and the pneumococcus is still a problem. Um, and depending where you are in the world, it is more of a problem. There are uh, two basically types of, of penicillin resistance. It's what we call intermediate or full penicillin resistance. And penicillin resistance affects a, a wide range of the beta-lactam family. The changes that go on are within what's called the bacterial cell wall, which is where penicillin and similar drugs exert their activity. So I think it's really quite, um, it, it's quite interesting that in the last, I guess, 20 years, we've seen what appears to be a, an apparent decrease in beta-lactam penicillin resistance. But in fact, what it really relates to is the, the, uh, the way in which we uh, assess resistance through something called a breakpoint. This is not the situation to describe that, but penicillin resistance amongst the pneumococcus is still an issue. And I think I showed fairly early on in my presentation, the resistance to ceftriaxone, um, which although it's not 25%, is still at a level where one could, would consider you know, the empirical approach of some of those drugs. So the pneumococcus is, an, is a formidable opponent. And never underestimate the pneumococcus. Is antibiotic resistance uniform across the USA? So I'm not sure if you heard the question, is antibiotic resistance uniform across the USA? The answer is no. Um, if you take the, the streptococcus pneumoniae with regard to macrolide resistance, or you look at E. coli and, and fluoroquinolone resistance, you'll see regional variability. I showed you a map of the US, which was, was using what's called the CDC census regions. There are nine of those. And those are based upon some certain CDC epidemiological studies. And you can see that there are differences between the Pacific region, the mountain region, when you go across to the East Coast and different parts of the, you know, the central and, the, and uh, Eastern USA. Now, that's talking just USA. You look at Europe, there are major differences between Scandinavian countries and the Mediterranean countries. Going over to Asia, you'll see differences between China, Japan, and Thailand. So I think my, my, the point I would like to make here is resistance is, is not homogeneous. Resistance does not stay put. Resistance can travel. And that a prescribing physician not only should know their local resistance rates to the major pathogens, strep pneumo, E. coli, and so forth. So I think, you know, not only should you know your local resistance, you should be aware of has the patient traveled recently? Now, I'm not expecting primary care docs to know what's going on in, in, in China, but at least just be aware that something else may be going on. So I hope that answers your question about homogeneity of resistance. Can we have time for one last question? And Dr. Tulasan, does antibiotic resistance matter? Does antibiotic resistance matter? I could be flippant and say, yep. But I hope in my presentation I showed that antibiotic resistance contributes to increased mor morbidity, so that's general sickness. It contributes to increased mortality, so more deaths, and as I said, it contributes to increased healthcare costs. So I think antibiotic resistance does matter. I would like to once again thank Dr. Glenn Tlotson for his presentation. Dr. Tlotson, do you have any final comments for our audience? First of all, I'd like to thank the audience for uh, listening to me for the last almost an hour. I hope you found it interesting and informative and that um, I've tried to put community acquired bacterial pneumonia into some perspective and the impact that bacterial resistance is having as we, as we try to manage this, uh, this awful condition. So thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. <laughs>
Thank you again, Dr. Tillotson. I want to remind you that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 7, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.